Well, welcome everybody, and uh, this morning we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Romans, and uh, why don't we turn in our Bibles, to stand together with me, and if you have Bibles in front of you, you want to turn to, or you can just listen as I read to you from the book of Romans as we're finishing up chapter 14 this morning. So I'll be reading from Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 23. Romans 14, 13 through 23. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in and of itself. But if everyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. So, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, as we go now to come now to this time in our service where we look into your word, I pray that your uh, spirit would be among us. I ask, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing and satisfying to you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As I said earlier, this uh, morning we're continuing our series and we're kind of finishing up on uh, the the last half of uh, chapter 14. Paul starts out the passage that we read by saying, therefore, and one of the things that uh, Bible students, students of the Bible of any level will, will know right away is that whenever you see that word therefore, the important thing to do is the way I like to say it is if you see the word therefore, see what it is therefore. So Paul is saying, therefore, in order to do that, we need to, uh, to do proper exegesis of the passage to look back to what we've already talked about. So just a brief reminder of what we said last week. Last week we talked about the struggle that the church was having uh, with the idea of, of, of change. And you had two different groups of people. You had the Gentiles who came from a background where they weren't used to all of the Jewish rules and regulations. They weren't used to the Jewish ritual. Uh, I likened it last week, and I will again this week, to the idea of a church that is, um, they, they weren't used to a church that was full of liturgy, you know, because the Jewish uh, faith was something like that. They, they had a, a lot of liturgical stuff going on. And so you had the Gentiles who came into that with, with no background of what that meant, and you had the Jewish Christians who came in with this, this background, this history, that the, this heritage that they had, that they'd grown up with that was important to them. And the problem in the church was when those two factions collided. Paul refers, not me, but Paul refers to those people, that the Jewish Christians, that were used to the, the history, that were used to heritage, that were used to, if I can put it in 21st century terms, the liturgical type of lifestyle, he refers to those as weak Christians because they're still struggling with the way things used to be. And he refers to the Gentile Christians, the ones that didn't have that background, uh, the ones that were free of all of those things as being the strong Christians. They were the ones that were free. And what Paul basically was saying to all of them, if you remember from last week, if you were here, is can't we all just get along? Can't we all just get along? Can't we put aside our differences and and look at the fact that the important thing is that we're worshiping God? In verses 1 through 12, he admonishes both the weak and the strong to live together and to let live. The last part of this chapter is sort of like Paul saying, okay, so we went through all of that. Now, here's some ideas on how you can make it work. 
Here's some ideas on how you can take these, these multiple factions, these multiple different types of back, back, uh, backgrounds, and bring them together to get them to work together in unity like a body should work. Because if you remember, the Bible in the New Testament repeatedly refers to the church of Jesus Christ as a body. Not just us. I mean, if you look around our, our fellowship this morning and you look at the different backgrounds of everybody that's sitting in this room, there's a, a, a lot of them. But when Paul's writing this, he's not writing just to one little section of the church. He's writing to the church as a whole. How would we get along with going, for example... Um, Trish and I were talking about this one pastor that uh, I'd heard, and he was Southern Baptist. How would you get along in a Southern Baptist church? I mean, you think the drums and the guitar and stuff here are, are a little bit different than you're used to? <laughs> you ain't seen nothing until you've gone to a Southern Baptist church where they, well, rather derogatorily when I was growing up, we referred to them as wall climbers, but that, that was really tacky. But we, we aren't used to that. But how do you get all of that together to work together like a body so that we can show Jesus Christ to the world around us. Because every single day, each one of us is surrounded by somebody that is going through some sort of struggle. You don't know what that struggle is. They may not share with you what that struggle is, but they're going through a tough time. And you may be the only bright light. You may be the only hope that they have. How can we work together to show that love of Jesus Christ to everybody? So, Paul says in verse... Uh, all right, get caught up there, Mike. Uh, verse 13 says, Therefore, stop, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any sort of stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Let me remind you now, Paul is not talking about Christian versus non-Christian, about believer versus non-believer. He's talking about how do believers react to one another. And he says, don't become a stumbling block to one another. I went to Bible college down in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, while I was going to college there, I was working a job that nearly full-time, going to college full-time, trying to raise a family. That's really fun. And uh, we went to, we were working at this uh, furniture factory. And what it was, is it was sort of a framing factory. We would uh, take the raw lumber, we'd cut it down to, uh, into the parts and assemble frames for couches and things like that. And we've sent it across town where it'd be upholstered and then sent out to the world beyond. And uh, I was sort of the shipping, receiving kind of guy, and I worked on getting lumber into the saws and stuff. They wouldn't let me really actually handle tools or try to cut things. And if any of you have ever worked with me on any kind of carpentry skills, you would know why because I, I don't do that. I think God has blessed us with people like Bruce and others that can actually do that kind of thing. And I'm very, very thankful for that because otherwise I'd be living in a refrigerator box somewhere underneath some bridge. So we were working with this, and there was a group of probably about six or seven of us from the Bible college that were working the night shift. So we would kind of, our job was to sort of get caught up on what the day shift crew didn't get done. And I was... I, this was, uh, I went back to school rather late, so I was probably uh, late 20s, early 30s. I should have been, I was probably late 20s. I should have been a lot more mature person than I was at the time, I'll be honest with you. And, and uh, me and a bunch of other, a couple of the other guys kind of got into a uh, <clears throat> uh, water fight one night, and we were chasing each other around this factory. And uh, I was chasing one of my buddies, and his intent, at least this is what he tells me later, his intent was to put some distance between me and him because I was gaining speed. So as he was running down the aisle, he grabbed a pallet jack, and his intent, he says, was to grab the pallet jack and pull it out so that it was between him and I. The problem is his hand slipped off it. And so what he really did is he took the arm of the pallet jack and brought it down right in front of me. And I tripped over it. And apparently, from what people tell me, from what they see, it was really rather impressive because I didn't know I could do in middle air somersaults. Landed flat on my back. Um, the pain on my back was only uh, dwarfed, was dwarfed by the pain on my leg. I still have a scar right about here 
on my shin from where I connected with the pallet arm or the arm for the pallet jack. And then there was, of course, going to the ER. And it, we were all Christians. You know, let me reemphasize that. We were all going to a Bible college. Uh, many of us were training for ministry and, you know, supposed to be ultra spiritual. So we did when, when the boss asked us what happened and we had to fill out the insurance forms and everything like that. We did what every well-meaning Bible college Christian student would do. We lied. I know. So now you know something else about your pastor. But we, we, we lied so that the OSHA people wouldn't be quite so upset because, you know, so we had to go through a bunch of training on making sure that pallet, arm jack, pallet jack arms were up and things like that. Why do I bring that up? It's not just a, a goofy story, but it's an, it brings up an illustration of what Paul talks about when he says a stumbling block. A stumbling block is something that we put in front of someone else to stop them from doing whatever they're doing. Sometimes it can be intentional, sometimes it can be unintentional, but the result is always the same, and that is it stops the progress of the person that, uh, is, that stumbles. And Paul says we need to stop being stumbling blocks to each other. In fact, what he says in verse 14 of what we read, he says, I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself, but if anyone regards something as unclean, for that person it's unclean. What Paul is talking about here is the big stumbling block in the church for Rome and in the New Testament church kind of goes back to what we talked about last week, the things people would eat and the days that they would celebrate. Again, if I could kind of bring it to a 21st century uh, example, the, the Jews believed that you had to worship on Saturday because that was the Sabbath and that's when they always worshipped. If we took that to our day, that would say that you know, somebody might say, well, you can only have church on Sunday. Sunday is the only real day to have church. And the Gentiles said, hey, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, doesn't matter. Let's just worship God whatever day we feel like. And there was real turmoil going on with that. The Jews still had their dietary ideas of what they had to do. And the Gentiles said, hey, if it's food, it's food. Let's eat it. I think back to what Jesus said. The number of times Jesus... Do you remember the number of times that Jesus got in trouble for healing somebody on the Sabbath? Because he was breaking the laws of that particular day. And Jesus said, the Sabbath wasn't made, man was not made to follow the Sabbath. The Sabbath was, was made for man to have an opportunity to worship God. Peter had the same problem with food. The day that he was sitting up on the rooftop and he was in deep prayer and he was hungry and he was, he was waiting for lunch be, to be prepared. If you remember the story in Acts, an, a big sheet comes down in, the, in front of him and on the sheet were all kinds of animals and all kinds of food that, that were unclean to the Jewish religion. And God said, Peter, get up and eat. And Peter looked and he said, I'm not eating this. You've told us from way back that we shouldn't eat this stuff. I will never eat anything unclean. And the sheet goes up into heaven and it comes down a third time and, and the, the voice from heaven says, Peter, get up and eat. And Peter says, I'm not eating that. That's unclean. And the sheet goes back up. It comes down a third time. Have you ever noticed that Peter seemed to have a hard time with things in threes? You know, he denied Christ three times. Jesus asked him three times if he loved him. This time the sheet comes down in front of him three times and God says, if I call something clean, don't you call it unclean. And what Paul is writing here in, in Romans is saying the same thing is, it doesn't matter what food you eat. It doesn't matter what days of the week you worship on. The important thing is that we know what we should do and that we worship God. But in verse 14, he says, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord, that nothing is unclean in itself, but if you regard it as unclean, then for that person it's unclean. That in a nutshell, is the problem. If I decide, let's just say, for example, if I decide that we're going to no longer have church Sunday mornings, that we're going to have church Saturday mornings instead. Well, let's say Saturday night. We're, not, we're just going to close this place down Sunday mornings and we're all going to meet together on Saturday night. Some of you would run me out of town on a rail because we're supposed to have church on Sunday morning. 
And others of you would say, hey, sleeping in on Sunday morning would not be a bad thing. In fact, like I said to, uh, I think it was Russ, I said, I was really glad he came this morning because to be honest with you, I love to preach, I love you guys, I love church, I would love to be elsewhere right now <laughs> on a gorgeous morning like this. You know? So does it matter what day we worship on? And that's, that was the problem, was what Paul would say, if you think Saturday is an okay to worship, fine. And if you say Sunday is an okay to worship, fine. The problem is how do you work that together? so that you're not being a stumbling block. And that's what his whole passage is about. You know, it's about knowing and, and being allow, allowing people to have differences of opinion. Uh, I taught special ed for about 20 years. And with my first year of teaching was a regular ed teacher and went into special ed teaching mentally and, and uh, physically handicapped kids. And uh, we were sitting down at, at lunch one of my very first days as teacher. And I had this uh, kid, I'll call, his name, I'll call him Bobby, uh, that was sitting there and we had corn for lunch. And uh, I had a rule in my classroom that you had to try everything on your plate. Bobby said, I, I, I don't like corn, corn makes me sick. I said, Bobby, corn doesn't make anybody sick. One bite of corn. No, I, 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 I can't eat corn. corn. Corn makes me sick. Bobby, it's corn. Corn is a vegetable. Corn's good for you. It will not make you sick. Eat it. Just one bite. I, 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 Bobby, do it. Well, Bobby did it. And proceeded to throw up all over his tray. That's when I talked to our occupational therapist person and found out that there's a lot of things to do with texture, especially with special needs kids. And she said, yes, indeed, that there's something to do with the texture of corn that caused Bobby's stomach to eject everything that he may have put in it in the last several hours. Corn is good for me. I love corn. You know what? If Bobby doesn't want to eat corn, he didn't have to have another kernel of corn the rest of the time that he was in my room. I respected his right to reject corn. And I think for us as believers, there's times when we need to respect the rights of people to feel differently. And that's hard for me. That's hard for us. It's hard for us to realize that, you know what? I don't see anything that makes sense of your position on how you feel about things, but I will respect the fact that you feel that way. If, on the other hand, as the weaker brother, you respect me for my feeling. And yes, that is, I think, the hard part for us as believers within the church, that's the hard part for us in our relationships and our families, is that idea of re mutual respect of that. And I'll be honest with you, I struggle with that. I like what Chuck Swindoll says. You know, and well, let me re let me say one more thing about that. Is that and that's this for both of us, whether you be a weaker person, a weaker brother in Christ, as Paul refers to you as, in which you really have a hard time holding on to the past, or if you're one of the stronger brothers, as as uh, Paul would refer to, who. Um, are okay with change and let's, you know, let's do all the new stuff. Whatever side you're on, I think what this verse tells us and what Paul is really saying is this, it's okay for us to be wrong. It's okay for us to be wrong. If this is how you feel about something, if this is the conviction you have for it, then follow it. You know, I, I, um, as I was uh, researching on this morning's lesson, I was listening to uh, or reading from uh, Chuck Swindoll's book called Amazing Grace, and he tells about the time that he went to a, a restaurant and he was sitting having dinner with some friends, and the waiter came up to him and, and was taking his order, and he looked at Chuck and he said, your voice sounds really familiar. And he didn't say anything. He didn't want to tell the guy who he was. He said, oh, okay, you know, and... That was the end of it. After dinner and after, when the waiter came up to, to give him the check and everything was done, he said, you're Chuck Swindoll, aren't you? And Chuck said, yeah, I am. He says, I thought I recognized your voice, but I wasn't sure until I saw you and you didn't drink any wine. Then I knew it had to be you. And Swindoll says, you know what? He said, I don't have a problem with wine. In fact, he said, I, 
enjoy coming home and having a glass of wine just about every night. But he said, because of what it might look like to someone else, he says, I will never have wine in public. Now that's Chuck's stand. That's not my stand. It's not, I'm not telling you it should be your stand. But that's the stand that he takes. And the reason he does that is he said, because somebody that's struggling with addiction, somebody that's struggling with alcoholism, and they might be having, and none of us, unless you've actually struggled with that, have a clue as to how tough that is. Might look at me, Chuck is saying this now, he said, might, somebody that's struggling with addiction, that's addiction, being addicted to alcohol, might look at me and have, be having a really bad day and thinking, you know, if Chuck can do it, what harm is one drink going to be? And Chuck says, and I become a stumbling block. And it's not just about alcohol in public, it could be words. When people look at you and hear the words that you use, does it make them think that they can speak that way? The way you act does make them think you can act that way and be a Christian. Paul says it's very important that we allow other people to have their views and we encourage them in that. But Paul also says something, or Swindoll also says something else, and Paul kind of alludes to it. And that is, he said, we need to be careful of the professional weaker brother. He, Paul, or Swindoll says the, the professional weaker brother is nothing but a legalist in, in sheep's clothing. The professional weaker brother is the person that says, you know what? what I say, this is how I feel, and you have to go along with how I feel because Paul says I'm the weaker brother and you have to go along with my feelings. See, stumbling blocks, whether they be the, the stronger person being a stumbling block or the professional weaker brother being a stumbling block, stumbling blocks, regardless of what size they are on, do the same thing. They impede our progress. They impede our progress personally. They impede our progress corporately. So what can we do to build unity? What can we do to become stronger? Maybe this video will help. How do, How we, do define we define the word, word unity? unity? After, After all, all, we hear, we hear it, it all the time. The time. Unity, unity in jobs, in jobs. Unity, unity in our schools, schools and, and unity, unity in, our in our church. But, but what, what is, is the implication behind the word? Is it, is it nothing more than a group of people working, learning, learning or worshiping together, together loosely linked by a common, common goal or belief? Perhaps, Perhaps unity begins as nothing more than, than an empty cup. A, a framework, framework created, created to house something bigger than itself. A vehicle, a vehicle built to contain a combination of ingredients, each, each with their own special qualities that, that make, make them unique. unique. Each, each consisting of elements and properties that, that make it perfectly suited to fulfill its purpose. Together, each piece makes its own valuable contribution, regardless of its use as a singular item. Individually, each element is by no means worthless, but when combined together by the hands of a skilled creator, they become something wonderful. A delicious blend of unity. drinkers that probably didn't have as much of an influence as for me <laughs> or for those of us that like coffee and frankly you know I don't do it very often but going to caribou or Starbucks and getting like a latte or something like that you know the fufu drinks or going to quick trip and getting theirs out of the machine <laughs> there ain't no comparison and it should be the same way within the church when we come to a point in our lives where we work together so well that we're just, we're, we're just excellent in what we do, not only here but out in the community. You know, unity is really means that it's love, loving each other in spite of our differences. And I mean truly loving each other. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say I love you and it's another thing to act like I love you. There's some of us that think it's okay to love each other, but we don't have to like each other. I don't find that in the Bible. 
how we can really love. So let me give you some ideas of that very briefly as we close. The first thing that we need to do, as I think, is to be convinced. Uh, first of all, let me show you these two verses. Uh, verses 19 and 20 says, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Work hard at that. If you're in a work situation where you're, where you're struggling uh, to get along, work hard at, at having peace within that. If it's in your marriages, if it's within the church here, if it's wherever, work hard at it. It's hard work. It's a lot harder work to build peace than it is to allow conflict and work toward mutual edification. Then it says, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for the person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. We kind of talked about that earlier. You know, if you think it's okay to do a certain thing, do it. But don't force other people to do it. So I think there's three things I think we need to look at. The first one is to be considerate. You know, just be, be nice to each other. Uh, Paul says, It is better... if." It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. It's kind of like what Chuck Swindoll said about having a glass of wine. You remember last week, for those of you who were here, I told you about Charles Spurgeon, who liked to have a good cigar after every, every Sunday morning service. And when he saw his name being used to advertise cigars, he quit smoking cigars. Why? Because cigars became all of a sudden wrong? No. He quit smoking cigars because he didn't want people to identify cigars with Charles Spurgeon. He wanted people to identify Jesus Christ and Charles Spurgeon. And when those two things came into conflict, he had to get rid of the thing that was the stumbling block. What is it in our lives that keeps us from that? You know, what, we, what we enjoy in our homes and what we enjoy in our private lives is one thing, but when we're out in the community, what do people see in us? The second thing is to be convinced. Romans 14.22 says, So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself. You know? And what Paul is really saying there is, figure out what you believe and stick to it. But, but do it by reading, chap, reading the Bible, based on what Scripture says. If somebody comes up to me and says, Well, I believe that we need to have... Uh, green jello, and cottage cheese at every church potluck. We just need to do that because that's what my grandma always had. I'm going to say to you, show me in the Bible where it says you need to have jello of any color or anything else mixed in it. Because if it's not in the Bible, then we don't have to do anything. What does the Bible say? And if the Bible doesn't say anything about it, that, those non-essentials, then the next question is to ask your, your friends, ask trusted, mature believers what it's about. And if they all say it's okay or they can't think of anything that's wrong with it, then here's the hard one. This is the one I have the hardest problem with personally, and I don't know where you're at with it. Here's the one I have the hardest part with it, and that is this. How is it going to affect the ministry? How is it going to affect people's view of who Jesus is? See, that's the crux. There's a lot of things in the Bible, that, or a lot of things the Bible don't, doesn't deal with. There's a lot of gray areas out there, but then we have to ask that ultimate question. When people see me doing this, when people see me saying this, when people see me following this particular lifestyle, are they going to be drawn to Jesus Christ or are they going to be pushed away from Jesus Christ? And that's a hard one. And what Paul is saying there is, if you feel it's okay, then, then do it in the privacy of your home. But if it's going to hurt other people, then consider your actions. And the last thing is to be consistent. Romans 14, 23, the last verse that we read this morning. Whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. What Paul is really saying here for me is, that if I decide that it's really wrong to have green jello at the church potluck, if I'm convinced of that. And I'm using that one because I think that's probably the safest example as I can come up with. If I really believe green jello is wrong, and you have green jello, more power to you. But as soon as I have green jello, even though I think it's wrong, then for me, it's a sin. And I need to deal with that. Paul is asking us 
to look at our lifestyle and not exactly how, not just how it affects us personally, but how it affects our brothers and sisters. Last week as we closed, I closed with this verse, and I want to close with it again because it's still true. And it kind of sums up everything we talked about in chapter 14. And it's the words from Jesus as he is in the garden of praying, and he's saying, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Green jello, which is cottage cheese. No, if you have love for one and for another. You see, that is what's going to show the world what Jesus is about. And we all know people out there that need to know that love that he has. This morning, we come to a time of taking the Lord's Supper together. What better time to think about what we're doing? Because Jesus said on the night that he was betrayed. He said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And what he was really saying by that is, as you take this meal together, remind yourselves of how I have influenced those around me. How I reached out to those people that really needed me. Those are the things that he wanted us to remember. Let's bow in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. And as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, I just pray... um, I pray for us. Uh, I pray for myself, first of all, for those, those times when I get so frustrated with the weaker brothers and I don't always respond well, and I pray that you forgive me for that. And I pray that you forgive us for that. I pray for those of us here that are the stronger brothers and sisters in Christ. I ask that you would help us to be patient. I ask that you would help us to be uh, considerate, that you would help us to be convinced in our own minds, but also aware of how we can affect others. I pray for those of us in this fellowship this morning that are the weaker brothers, the ones that are really struggling with how things seem to be changing around us, and we just have a hard time with that. And I just pray that you would help them as well to be patient and open-minded, and allow them to allow your spirit to work through them. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Now to him who is able to his plan through his power in each of our lives, to him who is able to do far above and beyond all that we could ask or imagine, to him be all the praise and all the honor and the glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.